This is our Kellerman talk, probably, I think, the most important talk of the year, at least what, what I consider, what most consider the most important talk, talk of the year. Many of the residents here probably don't remember Dr. Kellerman, um, but he is, if not one of the founders, the founder of this program. And we reserve this talk, um, especially for people who have made um, uh, not only national, but sometimes international um, strides in uh, healthcare and health policy. Uh, Dr. Leon Haley, who we'll introduce for a second, is one is a person we remember fondly here. Again, some of the residents probably don't remember him, but he kind of cut his chops and did a lot of the work here um, down here at Emory. And I certainly <laughs> um, learned a lot from him in my time um, uh, while he was here. And um, he's been an inspiration to a lot of us, um, especially some of us more Gosh, I guess I can't call myself junior faculty anymore, but certainly some of us younger folks. Um, let's see, Doctor, who, who's introducing him? I think is it, is it you, Sherry Ann? Yes, it's me. Okay, thank you so much, Sherry Ann. Um, appreciate your time. All right, good morning, everyone. It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Leon Haley. Like Dr. Taylor was saying, if you don't know him personally, you've definitely heard of his legacy at our institution. So it's truly an honor to have him here today. Um, I will definitely have to give the Sparks Nose version of his bio because if I were to talk about all of his accomplishments, we would run out of time. Um, so Dr. Leon Haley, he currently serves as the CEO of UF Health Jacksonville. He's the VP for Health Affairs and Dean of the University of, College, of Florida College of Medicine um, and Professor of Emergency Medicine. He was a former professor in the Department of Emergency Medicine here at Emory and served as Deputy Senior VP of Medical Affairs, Chief of Emergency Medicine for the Grady Health System and Vice Chairman of the Department of Emergency Medicine at Emory. Um, also previously served as the Emory Executive Associate Dean for Clinical Services at Grady and CMO of the Emory Medical Care Foundation. Um, he is a native of Pittsburgh and received his undergraduate degree from Brown University, um, his medical degree from the University of Pittsburgh, and his master's degree in health services administration from the University of Michigan. He completed his residency, including a year as chief resident in emergency medicine at the Henry Ford Health System in Detroit. Um, prior to his position at Grady and Emory, he was a senior staff physician at the Henry Ford Health System. He is an active board member of the Jacksonville Chamber of Commerce, the Jacksonville Civil Council, and several other associations. Um, Dr. Haley has interests and in publications in health administration, operations, and strategic management and diversity as it relates to healthcare and emergency medicine in particular. He has served on or chaired various hospital, university, and national committees, including SAEM and he is an oral board examiner for AMEM. He has several honors and awards, including being chosen as one of the Jacksonville Business Journal's ultimate CEO in 2019, Atlanta Business Chronicles Healthcare Heroes for 2005, and Georgia Association of Physician Assistants Physician of the Year Award in 2003. He has been funded by the Department of Defense, SAMHSA, Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, and the Healthcare Foundation of Georgia, and he has also served as the state of Georgia's Trauma Network Commission as an appointee of the Lieutenant Governor. Um, his talk today is titled, Are We Focused on the Right Arrow? So without any further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Leon Haley. Uh, hopefully you can see my screen. Thank you, Sherri Ann. I really appreciate that introduction um, and glad to be back, although I certainly, like you, wish it was in person and wish always the opportunity to come back in Atlanta and visit uh, some of my old friends and colleagues, a place that I spent um, 20 years at. So uh, great to be here and great to talk to you a little bit about, um, you know, are we focused on the right arrow? And I'll go into a little bit more details about that. Um, so this is downtown Jacksonville. So this is looking from the South Bank to the North Bank. Um, actually, the big red building in the middle is called the Jacksonville Landing. It got torn down during the middle of the pandemic. So Jacksonville has this unique quirky distinction of being the largest geographic city in the continent of the United States in terms of square mileage. So it actually stretches around 935 square miles, which makes it unique from 
the person in the urban core, people who live at the beach, people who live in what would normally be a suburb, people who live in sort of inner city neighborhoods as well. And so it creates unique challenges. The other thing the river is important for is it's part of Jacksonville's identity. It's a northern flowing river. So it comes out of an aquifer that's just north of Orlando and actually flows its way north through Florida, through downtown Jacksonville, and then ultimately out to the Atlantic Ocean. So if you're looking from your screen, it's sort of left to right. But the other thing I learned after I got here is the other significance of the river in terms of its you know, significance, um, importance to its history, importance to um, Jacksonville and sort of how it sells itself. Um, it is also part of the Great Divide. Um, so the Northern side of town beyond what you see downtown is really more of the urban core, um, tends to have a few more challenges from an economic standpoint, if not a lot more challenges from an economic standpoint. And the Southern side of town, particularly when you get to the area we call town center is where more of the wealth and concentration is in the city. And so the river is part of that great divide. And it helps us to take a step back from a healthcare leadership perspective and the world of emergency medicine that think about, you know, how are we making a difference? So I have no financial disclosures. This is one of those slides I wish we had some, um, but I do want to send a thanks to my strategic planning team for helping me with putting together some of my slides. And then I'm also on the American Hospital Station, a couple of different committees. And so I have some slides from them around looking at the challenges and opportunities in 2021 as we move forward. And I'll use those to sort of piggyback um, some discussion points and certainly want to leave time for discussion as we move forward. So let me just paint a little bit of a picture for you. So you heard me talk a little bit about Jacksonville. Um, so this is the five county area. Jacksonville has about 950,000 people in the five county area. And when you go beyond, I'm sorry, 900,000 people in the city of Jacksonville. And then when you go, um, which is in the red circle, and then if you go to the other counties, it gets closer to about 1.4 million people. And so um, it's a unique town. It's a heavy military presence, 77,000 military veterans. There are two active naval bases um, in the city. So there's a very large metro population. So this is a heat map. It's an index value. It's a community index map that was developed by an organization called Cogent. And it really looks at covering income, poverty, unemployment, occupation, educational attainment, and linguistic barriers that are then standardized and applied to any zip code across the country, quite frankly, anybody that has more than 300 citizens in it. And these zip codes are um, really, the higher the value, unfortunately, represents sort of the greatest economic, social economic needs. And it's also unfortunately painted with a greater picture of poor health outcomes, preventing preventable hospitalizations and premature deaths. Um, so if you look in the city of Jacksonville, you can see some of the zip codes. And you can obviously see some zip codes where there's almost no need at all. And so that's part of the dynamic. If you overlay the hospitals in the area on top of it, you can see where most of the hospitals are sitting as it relates to some of the economic challenges that you can see. So this is our primary downtown hospital. So we operate two hospitals in the city of Jacksonville, one downtown inner city academic safety net, very much like Grady, um, bigger in certain ways, smaller in others. Um, we also have a second hospital north, which um, I opened up after I got here about uh, eight, eight, 10 months after we got here. And, um, and it also serves primarily a more of a middle class population, but still one of the challenges. And you can see, if you remember that question I talked about the river, there's actually only three hospitals that are north of the river. So in the areas with more of the social economic challenges, um, you actually only have three hospitals that are in that area. And then the other hospitals um, are in more of the sort of affluent areas. This is the Mayo Clinic, which is really out by the beach. This is Baptist Beaches, actually, that's even its name, quite frankly. And so you can see how hospitals have scattered themselves. Um, and as you can imagine, the growth of the hospitals that are coming in the area is going even further south into more of the economics um, that really would support who they are. But if you take even a deeper dive, so if you go into 
when, you know, further into um, downtown Jacksonville, um, you can see that even within certain zip codes, but even within just a few minutes apart from each other, you have very dramatic differences in life expectancy. And you've probably have all heard this, and this will be a core theme of what I talk about throughout the conversation. You know, where you live, where you zip code, your place matters. It matters a lot um, in how you grow up. It matters in your educational attainment. It matters a lot as it relates to health. I live right there. So I live at the point of where that um, arrow is right on the river. And you can see the life expectancy if you were born and raised in which called the South Bank or San Marco. Um, but my downtown hospital is right there. So literally, if you walk out the door in our zip code that we talk about is 32209, and you have people who have very, very significant challenges. Um, and I think the folks that have been at Grady for a long time can remember when we had the, home, the Grady homes right on the other side of the expressway. That's what we have. We still have that in fairly significant strides. And so that is part of the challenge, but it also, as you will see during the conversation, is really part of the conversation. Conversation. I mean, part of the opportunity for all of us to think a little bit beyond where we typically do. So my goals today are really understand a little bit about the state of healthcare. We've already seen a little bit about that. Talk about focus and activities and interventions that we can create before and after medical care. Really focus in on some of the environmental challenges, the social needs, social determinants of health, and then where does technology, where does emergency medicine um, seem to fit into the equation and where can we best serve that? So healthcare was already challenging enough before this guy showed up. Um, and certainly it is certain, probably for your institution. And I know, cause I've kept in contact with some folks. It's been a big challenge for Emory. It's been a big challenge for grading. It certainly has been a big and unique challenge for us here in Florida. And so even with all the other challenges we were having, COVID has been here, but we have the vaccines and hopefully that will, along with continuing with the appropriate measures of masking and distancing and washing our hands, we'll be able to make our way through the pandemic. But it's more than anything, um, or as much as anything, it has really served to expose many of the things that I will talk about as we move forward. But as I said, prior to COVID and prior to some of the challenges that we were having, you know, hospitals are affected by a number of different challenges, right? So you've got cuts to Medicare reimbursement and the move to more of a value-based care, um, increasing supply, drug and labor costs. Labor costs for us, I know, and probably I suspect for many hospitals have really skyrocketed even through COVID, um, making sure that we have enough nursing staff to you know, take care of the patients, uh, making sure we have enough PA, making sure we have enough respiratory therapists. So it's been a unique challenge for us. Um, higher out-of-pocket costs for our patients has been one of those dynamics that many of our patients um, um, have had to manage and deal with. And of course, we want to look at investment in IT and analytics. There's been challenges around policy and payer mix and workforce challenges. So all of those things um, have, in fact, have affected hospitals. Um, and in fact, the way we operate, the way you operate, and in, even in many respects, the way you train and sort of the environment and operation that you change. In the United States, we spend a lot of money on healthcare and we kind of always have, and we've done it more so than any of the other comparable economic countries uh, across the globe. So this map really goes back to 1970 and takes it all the way out through 2019. You can see that the United States, in terms of its health consumption expenditures as a percentage of GDP, have always been much higher than other comparable countries. Actually, if you go to the website, you can actually click on each of of the countries below and see exactly where certain countries like France and Europe, I mean, France and Britain and uh, Spain will actually rise. But we have spent a lot of money. We always spend a lot of money on healthcare. The challenge though, and what you always have to ask yourself is, you know, what do we get for that money, right? So when we look at, and we can put any statistic we want, unfortunately, we can put a few of them and I've got one more. Um, but when you look at neonatal and post neonatal uh, mortality rates um, back in 27, you can see, unfortunately, the United States far exceeds, you know, the comparable country averages versus some of the other um, countries that we would more familiarly 
um, associate ourselves with. So a 3.9 um, per 1,000 death rates in the neonatal period and in the postneonatal period, sort of that one month through the first year, 1.9. So we exceed not only in the neonatal phase, but also in the postneonatal phase. And so you could make an argument, obviously, that we spend a lot of money, but we still continue to have significant challenge as it relates to neonatal and postneonatal mortality. The other dynamic that we've seen in the past year and certainly the last couple of years is our life expectancy is going down. All right, so for one of the few times in our history, certainly for most of the people on this call, um, the life expectancy for a person in the United States is actually going down. And that's going down pretty much across the entire spectrum. So if you look at where the United States compares to other comparable countries, so 78.6 versus 82. Um, but look, even just in the past year, so gone down one year, and we obviously have the 21 data for males, a decline of 1.2 years, even for females, which obviously historically have outpaced men, there's been almost a one year decline. And for our racial and ethnic uh, minorities, you know, those numbers are going down even further. It's obviously striking for somebody like me to see that the African-American um, uh, life expectancy continues to go down, which probably wouldn't feel so bad, except as I get closer to that number, it actually feels kind of threatening. So we certainly have unique challenges as a country. And even though we are spending a lot of money, um, then we're not getting the results that we would ask for. So I would ask you, going back to the title, are we focused on the right arrow? And this is a pretty simplistic diagram that says, you know, there's the patient, there's healthcare, and then there's the respective outcomes that we look for, right? Um, and historically, we focus a lot, a lot of our activities, a lot of our training, for example, your training, a lot of the research that we do, which I'll highlight in just a few minutes, really focuses on hospitals, right? It focuses on healthcare, focuses on physicians, focuses on academia, that's where we spend our time. Um, we don't focus on some of these other things. And maybe that's part of the question and we need to think through that. But it's not unreasonable to focus in on, you know, hospitals and healthcare, right? That's kind of what makes it sexy. That's why we go into it, right? We want to think about how we reshape healthcare. And as we think about all the things that, uh, you know, come or coming down the pipe, whether it's artificial intelligence, um, we spend a lot of time talking about precision medicine. I know Emory folks do as well. Genomics is important. Um, 3D printing, 3D printing saved us actually during COVID. Um, we were able to print nasal swabs with our 3D printer. We were able to prevent, um, uh, print masks um, for our flight paramedics um, that would, were able to fit appropriately. Um, so there are a lot of things that we focus on as it relates to healthcare, because that's where the pace of disruption, pace of change um, really exists. And we also know that, you know, the digital divide, the digital needs are critically important and it drives the pace of change. And so that's why we tend to focus in on what happens at the hospital, what happens sort of at that physician level. We spend a lot of time thinking of the next best hospital. Um, I know I am actually. So one of the projects that we're working on in addition to some of the myriad of initiatives is trying to replace our hospital tower. So it's an old building, it's 50 plus years old. And so we're working very closely with our master planning group along with the city of Jacksonville to think about how do you start to rethink and refocus on you know, what a hospital of tomorrow looks like? How is it shaped? I will tell you one of the big focuses on that um, will be around our educational initiatives. How do we incorporate education and research into the hospital towers of the future? But that's what we spend our time and our efforts on. If you take even a further deep dive, you can see that we spend, you know, going into the individual hospital room, right? And thinking about, you know, what are the different ways that we can take care of patients and be much more sophisticated in it? I won't go through each of those. You can certainly read through them. But, you know, in addition to not only designing what the hospital of tomorrow looks like, we spend a lot of time designing what the individual rooms are going to look like. I know when I moved to Jacksonville and we were getting ready to build our new hospital tower, one of the big focuses on was making sure that every room had an iPad in it. 
um, so that patients could order their food, but also look at their medications, track their results. Um, and so we build a hospital that every room has an iPad in it. And so patients are able to do a lot of their control. And so we will continue to see efforts um, really designed at, you know, how do we design rooms? And there's nothing wrong with that. I think that it's completely appropriate um, for us to think about what the hospital rooms of the future look like. In emergency medicine, um, you're, you are blessed to be led by Dr. David Wright, who was one of the foremost researchers in emergency medicine, um, did a lot of early work in traumatic brain injury, and, uh, and it's been a big part of the department's focus. Um, but there's obviously a number of other things that we focus on in emergency medicine. And again, these are at the hospital physician level, right? So we look at sepsis and we think about the pharmacological interventions we need to make um, trauma and injury prevention, shock and resuscitation. Um, so a lot of our focus is really on, you know, what we do at the hospital level, what happens in the departmental level, and that's appropriate. Um, and that's part of your training and where your focus lands. We also spent a lot of time, and I, I, I can't remember when this was introduced, but I remember it was part of some of our initial projects way back when in the old Grady ER, but really to start to think about structure and process and how that would fit in, how it would take care of you know, patients, how we move patients through our system, how do we get them taken care of from triage to in the room to out of the room to upstairs or home or wherever the case may be. And when you do all that, you, know, you spend a lot of time thinking this is what it's supposed to look like. Um, but in reality, it looks more like this. And that's the good Dr. Shane leading rounds many years ago. This picture actually ended up in the front page of the New York Times and made him famous. But, you know, that's us rounding in tight quarters with patients in hallways, not enough beds, not enough rooms um, to take care of patients. And on the right, you know, before we became all electronic and technical, again, rooms that were completely full with admitted patients, no matter how we focused in on structure and process, you know, we were still challenged. And I think you guys are still challenged. I know we're still challenged. Um, and you have nice space, we don't. And so it makes it a unique challenge for all of us um, to continue to focus on how are we going to take care of patients and how are we going to do that. And then you end up being, you know, the, what I call the safety net of the safety net. So you practice in a large, big safety net organization at Grady. Um, and so do we here in our practice here in UF Health Jacksonville. But, you know, when we can't figure out, when we don't think about that first arrow, then that's when we start to see people that are in the EDs that really shouldn't be. So I'll spend the remainder of the time thinking about, okay, so it's nice to focus on MD and hospital and healthcare systems, but what if we really start to think, and this is where I you know, put on that CEO hat or the Dean hat and think, what if we really start focusing on patients, right? What if we really continue to focus in on the social determinants of health and personal choice in zip code? Can we really make a difference in how our patients will do and how they will prevent, uh, present to our emergency departments, if at all, right? Isn't the ultimate goal of an emergency department to be completely empty on some level so the patients are there. So I would ask that we really start to think about what is the right arrow that we really need to focus on. So I wanna spend a little time walking through sort of some of the, the environmental scan that the American Hospital Association and a number of us work on. And I won't walk through each of those, but I wanna highlight those that really focus in on that first arrow, right? And really think about you know, how we think about health equity, diversity and inclusion, how we think about um, um, our access and affordability, how we think a little bit about relief. And so we'll use these to kind of piggyback on these, but these will be big themes for all of us as we think about 2021. And so there's no doubt we just take a step back of COVID-19's impact um, on everything that we do. Um, you can see a $323 billion projected losses to hospitals and health systems in 2020. 67% um, of hospital leaders believe some of their patient volumes will not return to a baseline. I don't know about you, but our overall ED volume is still off about 15%. Um, our actual pediatric, we have a busy pediatric ED, um, it's off about 40%. And that number has been pretty stagnant um, over the last couple of years. And many of our outpatient visits for our clinics are still down. So that has been a continual challenge for us. And as we think about hospitals and moving forward, what we're able to offer, we will continue to have those challenges. 
It's also a challenge because the economy that supports what we do is going to stagger and it's going to take a little while to recover. Um, and you can see, you know, where we were in 2019 prior to beginning of the pandemic. I don't know where Atlanta was, but I know in um, Jacksonville, the actual unemployment right before the pandemic was actually about 2.7%, um, which essentially means that everybody who wants to be employed is employed. And unfortunately, you can see that rapid rise um, on unemployment, which, as many of you know, can tend to, and I've got a slide that shows a little bit later, which really leads to the sort of challenge with coverage. It leads to challenges with the number of uninsured. It leads to the challenge with just out-of-pocket costs. And all of those things really impact you know, our ability to care for patients and, again, affect some of those upstream um, factors that we talked about. Yet 58 million people um, filed unemployment over the course of this past year. And our gross domestic product, because of people's ability to work or not work, and will be significantly affected. So these are background pieces of information um, that will play important to us. But back to that first arrow, right? So if we think about you know, the changes that we would like to make as it relates to really impacting health, you know, let's think about the societal factors that influence health, right? Let's think about rebuilding our healthcare systems where we are actually making true investment in an individual's health and well-being. So many hospitals like ours, like Grady, like Emory, make a lot of community benefits. And you know, you can see about hundred billion dollars from our tax exempt hospitals in the last several years. Um, and you can see what some of those expenses are. But when you take the deeper dive, one of the big challenges for all of those hospitals and one of the challenges for many of our patients is around food, right? Something as simple as food insecurity has become an increasing focus. I know for our institution, um, and I'll talk about this in just a second, but I know we're going to develop a food pharmacy. And part of the reason is, if you remember that slide way back when, when we've got the life expectancy of 61, Part of the reason is there's not a grocery store for several miles for many of the patients that we have. And so, in fact, the one Publix that we did have actually moved out right before the pandemic, believe it or not. And thankfully, the Winn-Dixie team came in, was able to replace that. But it's not enough when you have patients that have food insecurity, food challenges. Um, and we saw that when schools began to close, where kids were the only meals that they were having was either breakfast or lunch, that the school became impacted when they were no longer going. So one of the things we are building and much very similar to a Grady is, is a true food pharmacy and have the ability for patients um, to access food on a regular basis. Now, the sad part about all this is none of this is new, right? These are things that we have known for a long time as it relates to the impact of the social determinants of health and population. And it goes back to the um, 1790s, you know, uh, Johann Peter Frank, who's a German physician, talked about the diseases caused by the poverty of the people and by the lack of all goods of life are exceedingly numerous, right? Um, so known that for a long time and yet, you know, how have we focused and what are the things that are critically important to us? So you may have seen this before. This is the social ecological model of health, which really talks about the role of individuals along with a number of other factors that play into it. And this was developed to understand the dynamic interactions between various personal environmental factors. And these were described in the First World War as a reaction to the narrow scope of research for some of our developmental psychologists. Um, and it helped bridge the gap between behavioral studies and small studies. Um, so really developed in the early 1970s and formalized as the theory in the 1980s. But it is a way to think about health and policy and how they interact with each other and where the community falls in, where the institution falls in, um, because that is how we're going to address that first arrow. You've probably seen a version of this slide where we've talked about, you know, health is more than clinical care. So, you know, 10%, 10 to 15% of what we do as, as physicians and clinicians, um, that's all. You know, the rest of it is around the environment, it's around personal behaviors, it's around family history and genetics. And so the question is, you know, how can we continue to address that? Because that's really all part of that first arrow. 
So when you start to really think through that, then you really think about, you know, different ways to think about the true social determinants of health. Um, so we look at a model every year. So we look at our local data, our zip code data, um, we look at our county level data, and we look at health outcomes, right? And I'm sure there's a similar version um, at, uh, in, in Atlanta and Grady. And we look at, you know, impacts on mortality, morbidity, life expectancy, healthcare expenditures, health status, functional limitations. Um, but more importantly, we think about, you know, different buckets that we can begin to try and help address, you know, patients um, and their experience, what happens to them, how they make our way through our hospitals and health systems that they have to in society. Um, but the buckets to think through around the community and social context, you know, how engaged is the community in the conversation, you know, what are the respective support systems, what about the economic stability? I showed you the slide on, you know, the um, sort of uh, un un unemployed, which, you know, get as high as 10, 15 percent um, nationally, obviously, in different parts of the country, it was even bigger numbers. But you can see it's also going to take a little bit of time to get back. Even a year later, Jacksonville is only back to 5 percent. Um, but imagine the economic stability of debt and employment and expenses and income that comes with them. There was an experiment that was done a couple of years ago that actually is still going on. And I think it was outside of Sacramento where they made a decision to give every, um, every uh, family who had children, you know, X amount of dollars, I think it was $500 just to make sure they could be economically stable. And it's made a big difference in child welfare, child outcomes, health, those kinds of things. And I think that is part of the bill that's being looked at at a federal level right now, which is if you have children to support the economy of the children. Uh, we look at the educational models, early childhood education, higher education. Jacksonville has a unique challenge. It really does not like to tax itself. Um, I'm part of a group that's been looking at public financing for the city. And unfortunately, unlike Tampa, Orlando, Miami, Fort Lauderdale, Jacksonville takes high pride in not taxing itself. The problem with that is it's made very little investment um, into the school system. Um, in fact, so much so that a separate penny tax had to be created last year. Um, so we have some challenges with the schools, but all of that impacts, you know, how people do and how they will, you know, come out or and how they will re react um, to where their health lands. Food, we've talked about neighborhood and physical environment. So what is the safety? Um, Jacksonville also unfortunately has a distinction of having the highest per capita murder rate of any major city in the state of Florida. So a big challenge. The last mayor ran on the, on the policy that he was going to fix some of the crime issues. And unfortunately, even in the middle of the pandemic, you know, our crime rate, particularly our murder rate went up. But if you have a safe environment, you have playgrounds, you have housing, all of those things will make a significant difference. And so as you think about health and you think about the things we do, your training for the residents in the room, for the faculty in the room, you know, we're just one of, you know, six buckets um, that are part of how we should start to think about health and how we can think about things that we can focus on as an organization. Um, this is a busy slide, but really the only thing I wanted to highlight because it looks through the same institutional challenges, living conditions, risk behaviors, um, but I just wanted to focus in on some of the initiatives that I know we are undertaking. Um, so one of the positions I created shortly after I got here was I recognize our role as, a, as an institution in trying to support the community and taking a deeper dive in the zip code 32209. So we created a new role called the Vice President of Community Engagement, right, to make sure that we had somebody out front who was really helping with a number of our initiatives. And so we have a number of programs that we're working on actively where we're working with the school systems, we work with our local colleges, training environments to support that. Um, LISC is a national organization that you may have heard of that does a lot of investment in communities and cities. And so we're working very closely with them to get, you know, national organizations, local organizations to invest in the community, right? This isn't invest in the hospital. This is really how do you invest in the parks? How do you invest in uh, businesses in the community? Um, Lift Jacks is a specific group that we partner with to look at poverty that's east of us. Um, so you saw our 61, but right to the east of it. 
us, it was around 66, um, but it's a unique community. It was um, one that um, struggles with septic tanks and a number of different things. And so they have a specific goal of focusing on, on that particular product. And then you can see a couple others. I'll talk more about the Urban Health Alliance that we have. So what we've tried to do is take a step away from all the things that we're doing as a hospital. And don't get me wrong, I'll come back to this. You know, we're still trying to grow. We're still trying to invest in our, our capital. We're trying to invest in our hospitals. Um, we're building an ambulatory surgery center, very similar to what you guys are building across the street. Um, but we also feel there's a big, big need for us to invest in our community, invest in um, the citizens that surround us. So much so that we actually partner. So even though I made a little bit of fun of some of my sister hospitals and where their locations are, um, there's been a renewed um, uh, experience and renewed desire from all of the hospitals to really partner together to make sure that we can look at um, hospitals, systems, how we can interact with our community, how we can identify with the community ones, right? By the way, so this is also us going to the community and making sure we understand what the community needs, right? So it isn't us coming in and telling them what to do. It's also, what are the things that are important to you? And so we go through and you can see a big hodgepodge of things that when we talk to those communities, which are largely African-American, what's important, what are the challenges, we go through that data and try and sort through it. And when we did that, um, and we, just, we do this every three years where we take a deeper dive back we're due this year, you know, those are the things that really came up for many of our patients. Like when we talk to them, it's again around things around access, behavioral health, cancer, diabetes, poverty, social environment, those became critically important. And we narrowed it down to these. And so these are the things that as, as a hospital hospital, health system, excuse me, other health systems in the community, we all collectively focus in on what you see. So access, behavioral health, poverty, obesity, maternal fetal health, cancer, vulnerable populations, so people on the fringes. And so these are the hospitals in the community that work closely together with us to really try and address, again, going back um, to that first arrow. And then one of our specific initiatives um, is what we call the Jacksonville Urban Health Alliance, where we take our organizations or our people that are housed who would do this work or in the service community, do a lot of education research. And just, you know, because it is the Kellerman um, uh, lecture, making sure that we are all engaged in policy and working very closely with the city and state to think about how do we change um, the laws to support that. So wouldn't be an appropriate talk to talk about sort of that first arrow. We don't really talk about health equity and diversity and inclusion. Um, so this is COVID-19 data. Um, and I think you're probably more familiar with, but you know, if you are a person of color, you know, your case rate, your hospitalizations and your mortality are higher. All right, you know, unfortunately, that's something we've always known and COVID has really brought it to the forefront. And so you can see the unique challenges for many of our patients, particularly many of the patients um, that Grady serves. It's also important to make sure we're understanding and talking the same language and I won't read through them, but you can see the differences around health disparities, which are looking at burden of disease, health equity, which is removing those kind of things. And then what can we do as institutions and organizations and people to remove the barriers, right? So how do we we, as I was in a, a panel last week, how do we not only just change you know, what people stand on, but how do we change the fence? How do we make it a little bit different for us? Um, speaking of, this is some um, data on um, lives lost. So you get back to that life expectancy document I showed you earlier. And again, the challenges of being Black and Hispanic and American Indian, Alaska Native, you know, your lives, your average years of potential life loss were greater than your white counterparts. And so those are things that we as health systems and, and physicians and clinicians stepping outside of our boundary really have to take a deeper dive. We know that race matters, we've talked through that, but we also know, as we've said all along, that place matters. And this is cardiovascular disease. We've known this for a long time, where you live, you know, where that impacts your mortality as it relates to you know, cardiovascular disease. There's a slide I presentation I used to do for a group of high school kids and we went through diabetes. And if you look diabetes and obesity, and you look at the changes in diabetes and, hyper and obesity over the last 20 years, basically almost the entire country is obese, particularly in the South. You know, we live in the stroke belt. Um, so those things will always matter. 
So coverage matters um, as it relates to, you know, how do we think through, you know, again, that first arrow, you know, getting people back and being insured. You know, a lot of people became insured over the course of last year. Um, so big deal. And unfortunately, again, back to sort of the race matters, you know, if you were African-American or Hispanic, you know, the likelihood that you lost coverage was even more likely. So those things that contribute um, to that first arrow became critically important. And you can see where some of those uninsurance rates are across the country. And unfortunately, Unfortunately, you know, you didn't expand Medicaid, we didn't expand Medicaid, many of our Southern sisters did not as well. And so when you didn't expand Medicaid, it's been a unique and difficult challenge for many of our patients in terms of their ability um, to access system. Now, I just spent a lot of time talking about, you know, that first arrow, how do we flip the switch, but we can't lose sight, as I said, of that second arrow. It remains critically important for us um, to think through, you know, how do we continue to rebuild and reimagine? Um, how do we continue to innovate and take care of patients better? Um, you know, I think for many of us, if you'd have told us in January of last year where COVID would be and we would have a vaccine available by the end of last year, I'm not sure we would have believed it. But yet, because of collective investments by the government and the private sector into innovation and research and creation, we're able to do that. So I will tell you that we still need to continue to innovate. So we'll still need you and your work in emergency medicine and your colleagues um, to continue to do that. I know for us, it's really around continuing to create the healthiest generation. That's what we try and focus in on. And these are focus areas for us as an organization. Um, and it's not all of them, obviously, but we really focus in. And you can see a big part of that is still health disparities, but we have a number of different uh, programs that we look at. If you look at some of our cancer data in our city or particularly around our hospital, it's terrible, right? When you look at sort of the race and ethnicity as it relates to cancer mortalities or different late stage breast cancer presentations. Um, and we focus in on a number of this different areas. But we also continue to need to think about being disruptive um, and think about, you know, who can we partner with? You know, who are we working with? So Walmart Health is moving into downtown Jacksonville or with the community of Jacksonville. Um, so instead of approaching them from a competition standpoint, we thought about how can we work with them, right? Their model is going to be primary care, behavioral health, dental care, um, which we don't, we don't tend to talk about oral health health very much, but we think about ways we can partner with them. So how can I partner with CVS and Aetna? So we will continue to need to focus in on, you know, how can we deliver care better? How can we continue to be disruptive as it relates to the care delivery model? And as it relates to the care delivery model, you know, what are the other things that we need to think through to support our patients um, as hospitals, as health systems? You know, what are the things that we want to look at? Um, Recently for our organization and based and with really the university, um, a $70 million investment in um, artificial intelligence. So we had a grateful donor who gave $25 million to the institution personally, and then also had his company contribute $25 million. And now the university's put another $20 million on top of it. So a $70 million investment um, in, in artificial intelligence, so much so that we're you know, starting a whole series of initiatives around faculty hires and new people. But it's really to take a deeper dive. You know, how can we use artificial intelligence to really drive our treatment parameters, our protocols, how we work with nurses, how we work with our physicians, um, how we work with all of our students. That be, those are all very important. But also because of the uniqueness of our institution being here in Jacksonville, we also have a deep focus in on um, health equity and um, health disparities. So we're going to really drive quality changes with um, artificial intelligence to really support that because, you know, while yes, there is a focus on that first arrow, we still need to make sure um, that we're dealing with the second arrow as well. Digital health will continue to be critically important. Um, we were doing probably as a system, maybe 30 telehealth visits a day and very quickly within a matter of a week or two was up to 15, 1600 visits per day. Um, and so we'll continue to do that. We actually will form a new 
digital health um, division moving forward, but it's a good way to access. It's also a good way to think through, you know, some of the disparities we talked about and how do we create access for folks. Um, believe it or not, our most digitally capable group, when we look at all of our clinics, is one of our clinics that's 100% Medicaid. So don't make the assumption that because it's a different patient population, they don't have access to health, telehealth or a phone. They're actually our most capable group, but we'll continue to push telehealth as a way to address you know, some of the issues as it relates to healthcare, health disparities, and think through that um, moving forward as an organization. If you put all those things together, let's start to think about a new future healthcare ecosystem, right? To support all the things that we've just talked about, right? That we have the right to payment and financing plan. We're gonna connect consumers, look at daily activities, integrate home care, leverage some of our social support, right? So if you can create that, then you'll come up with a model where the patient is the centerpiece of that. And then we as healthcare systems will work on trying to support all of this initiatives along with a number of our community partners, other healthcare partners, but you'll see if you look at this sort of future healthcare system, the hospital, you know, is a small portion, right? It's a small piece of what we're trying to do sort of in this back corner, right? It's really around, do we have the payment structure? Do we have these institutions supported? Can we take care of people at home? All of those things will contribute significantly to really making a difference on it. So I just want to finish with just a couple of slides. It, 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 it wouldn't be good to talk about how we're going to do all this without talking about you, right? And talking about your colleagues, your nursing colleagues, your other colleagues, and just know that we know that there's a tremendous degree of mental health challenges for our clinicians. Um, you know, we already were worried about burnout or um, fatigue for many of our clinicians, and that's obviously gotten worse during COVID. It's been a challenge um, for all of us. We have a center called the Center for Healthy Minds and Practice um, that was busy pre-COVID and has become exploded so much so that we've added two psychologists to um, their repertoire to support our nurses and our faculty and our residents. Um, people are suffering from challenges with sleep and feeling overwhelmed. So just know that we can't do any of this until we can continue to work on some of our mental health challenges and until we can continue to work on wellness and support. And so we work very closely when I put my other hat on is, you know, how can we continue to support um, um, our staff, our people, how we train them, how do we make sure that technology is doing all the things that are critically important for us. And then finally, you know, certainly a renewed commitment on behavioral health. Much like you, we take care of a large prison population in our downtown center. We got a the prison, I mean, we got a large prison um, group that has a large mental health challenge. And so those are unique challenges and not a lot of resources. And so, and so in addition to just the unique challenges of being a prisoner, now you've added mental health and it becomes a focus point for us. So we're gonna continue to need to focus on mental health as we move forward as an organization. And then lastly, I'll just say, you know, we had a substance abuse problem. We still have a substance abuse problem. So if you look at opioids and their usage and overdoses from opioids, it went up um, during the pandemic. And so just know that although we've been focused on COVID and focused on the pandemic, that there clearly is a need for us to get back to behavioral health and substance abuse moving forward. So I'll just conclude that um, in order to really get back to those arrows, right, it's going to matter. The leaders are going to have to matter. How we suck, put the right structure is going to have to matter. You know, how we have medical education, how do we have research, those are all going to be important. Community partnerships are critically important. Legislation and policy, right? So this is not an easy lift, right, for us to do that. So if we're really going to make a difference, we can't get defensive, right? You know, maybe it's not part of our primary mission or responsibility but in order for us to take care of our community, in order for us to take care of our citizens, we're going to have to really drive that, right? So it does require coming out of our box. It requires coming out of the emergency department. It requires coming and working with our community leaders, our city leaders to really support policy, legislative change to really support. For example, I'm on the Jacksonville Electrical Authority, right? You would think, why would I be on that? Part of that is to think about how can we improve the electrical grid here in Jacksonville, but we're also responsible for wastewater. Um, so thinking about changes we can make to the septic tank and to the sewer system. So those are all things um, that become critically important. So in the end, 
yes, we absolutely need to work on the middle arrow. We need to work on what we do in a hospital sector, what we do in a healthcare sector, um, the care that we deliver, the research that supports that, the education we need to train it. Um, those become critically important. But I would argue, again, that the key moving forward for us, based upon everything we know, the data that we have, the outcomes that we want, determinants of health, of personal choice, zip code, those are going to be more and more important as we move forward as healthcare providers. And so the challenge for you is to think about, you know, what we do on a daily basis in the ED, but how do we take things out of that and how do we think about shifting our focus? So hopefully, um, you know, it's always a short amount of time, but you just had a quick snapshot of where we are today. What are some of those unique challenges? You know, understand a little bit about some of the events that we have, you know, where that social determinants of health really play in the equation, understand the impacts of our social needs and, you know, where we in emergency medicine can fit in that dynamic um, to support that. So. It's always great to be back virtually, uh, would have been better in person, but i um, happy to answer any questions and really appreciate the opportunity to talk to my old friends and colleagues. So I'll stop there.